cool on the beat. Wow, such uh, beautiful music. Uh, certainly the kind of music that uh, gets one in the mood. Uh, thank uh, goodness it's almost the weekend, right? Uh, but welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Shared Value Africa Initiative. It is a platform where business leaders are engaging about how better to grow the economic pie for all to enjoy. My name is Fifi Peters, and I am quite excited uh, to be facilitating the session here today. Uh, this is the uh, second CEO Connect uh, forum, uh, following one that was held in June, and I am told we have over 400 uh, registrations, uh, really speaking to the uh, seriousness out there to create a shared value in what we know is a very unequal world. The agenda for today is uh, very simple. We'll uh, certainly be mapping out a road path and how best we can move forward in innovating with scale and equality. You'll be hearing from a number of uh, business leaders from across the continent who will be weighing in on the exact issue. We will also have a fireside chat between some of the founding members of the Shared Value Africa Initiative who will uh, share their uh, thoughts of what is happening regionally and also a global perspective to add some color into the theme and then going into a panel discussion where thought leaders, uh, business leaders, captains of industry will uh, be bringing us up to date with how they are creating shared value within their organizations and also their uh, solutions on how better to scale it for equality. Uh, it's an interesting afternoon, uh, certainly, that we do have lined up for you, and I'm really looking forward to it, as I did say. I would encourage you to feel free to express anything, any outcomes, any statements that you do hear today uh, from the speakers during the fireside chat uh, on social media. For those who were not able to join us today, uh, you can uh, use the hashtag Shared Value Initiative. That's right, Shared Value Initiative, and also, or Shared Value Africa, rather. Use it, Shared Value Africa, and you can also rope in the team uh, using their handle SVAI Africa. That's SVAI Africa. With that said, I would like us to get on with the program and I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker for this afternoon, Ms. Adeolu Adewumi Zah, who is the CEO of Alliance Nigeria. She has been in the role since uh, September 2020, which is a year after she became the first female board member for Alliance Nigeria. Adeleo has over 20 years' experience working in the global financial services industry across 
four continents. As a leader, she is focused on driving growth and transformation. Adeleu, good afternoon to you, ma'am. It's over to you. Thank you and good afternoon. I feel honored and privileged to give the opening remarks for this session of the Shared Value Africa Initiative CEO Connect Forum. Thank you, Tiki, for another opportunity to share my Afro-optimism with the world. The other day, a new colleague apologized to me because he has somehow damaged his suit. So was quote unquote forced to attend our meetings in our customary native dress. What he did not realize was here at Alliance Nigeria, we recognize our local culture. More than that, we embrace and showcase it at every opportunity, as you may have already noticed from my video screen. All this to say that I am truly passionate about Africa and thrilled by the immense potential I see and experience across our continent. Thus, I'm always happy to join in discussions that contribute to the development of us as a people. The world is changing ever more rapidly, and this is a beautiful and historical time. As we lay the foundation for transformation, innovation, and equality across our continent. During the last CEO Connect Forum in June, we shared ideas on creating a new business system that not only provides financial growth for our various organizations, but has a corresponding positive impact on our society, what has come to be termed profit with purpose. We also highlighted the benefits of competitive collaboration, transparent discourse, and best practice exchange. As a panelist, I specifically emphasize partnerships to drive financial inclusion. On partnerships, all across Africa are opportunities for growth. The challenges we face today present us with the biggest opportunities for development. However, we must collaborate and partner with shared value in mind for a number of reasons, but most importantly due to the nature and diversity of Africa. The diversity of Africa requires us to have strong strategic partnerships, not only among ourselves within the private sector, but also with governments at both local and regional levels. On financial inclusion, we must continue to build a foundation of education and trust, creatively looking for ways to provide access to financial tools, including insurance, as this is the key to unlocking the potential of personal finances. The theme for this CEO Connect Forum is innovation for scale and equality, one Africa, one voice. An important conversation to have at this time Considering the many changes to business as the global economy readjusts following the impact of a global pandemic. One of our global strategic objectives here at Allianz is to transform our organization to become simple, digital, and scalable. Note that for us, scale is not the same as size, but rather reaping benefits from our size, i.e. being more than the sum of our parts by sharing knowledge, best practice, and technological assets across a group. Sounds a lot like the aim of the SVAI, doesn't it? Equality is also top on our priority list, with 150,000 colleagues spread across 70 plus countries, both diversity and inclusion, and valuing the differences of our employees are an essential part of our corporate success and competitiveness to quote from one of our global management members. At Allianz, 51% of our workforce are women. We believe gender representation is one of the key levelers for gender equality. So this is why we've defined a set of ambitious targets aiming to have women in executive teams at minimum of 25%, but 40% in talent pipelines by the end of this year, only a few months from now. We are fully committed to providing and maintaining workplaces which ensure all employees of the company are treated with dignity and respect and are able to work in an environment free of discrimination and harassment. We are proud of our diversity and believe it is fundamental to our success and innovation as a company. As believers in purpose-driven leadership, we're happy to share these initiatives with our customers 
and with you, the general business community, to spur conversations and deliberations for innovations and equality across Africa. I have no doubt that our panelists are ready to share similar inspiration examples and insights from their own markets and their own industries. Once again, I'd like to welcome and thank everyone and every participant who has registered for this CEO Connect Forum. Let's now speak with one voice for Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Adeleo. As you can see, uh, both her and I got each other's uh, memos. Uh, orange is the, the uh, color for today, and it's a fabulous color uh, in my view. And uh, the conversations that we are having today, uh, building on the Afro-optimism that Adeleo did set in terms of the tone, of course, you do know, are a buildup towards the fifth uh, annual Africa Shared Value Leadership Summit that will be taking place in November on the 8th and the 9th. But until then, uh, today we are trying trying to really lay a very solid foundation on how to innovate with scale and quality. And I imagine that a number of uh, business leaders uh, we'll say that uh, creating a profit with purpose is very necessary, but it's also uh, filled and laden with complexities. And I certainly look forward to hearing how some of the business leaders who are currently doing that within their capacities from banking, as you will hear, telecoms and also the uh, tech scene are managing to do just that. But before then, I would like to introduce our fire chat set uh, segment right now, and uh, that will be uh, presented by two individuals who have been driving the concept of a shared value for some time now. That is a Deki Barnard, who has been involved in shared value uh, in the region for uh, over three years, as well as uh, Mark uh, Kramer, who has been uh, driving the shared value force globally for over 10 years. Uh, Deki is the founder and the CEO of both Shift Impact Africa and Shared Value Africa Initiative, while Mark is a leading, a leading researcher, a writer, speaker, and consultant on strategies for social impact. Deki and Mark, good afternoon to the both of you. And Deki, I'll hand it over to you right now to blow us away with Mark in your discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pepi, and thank you, Adelaide, for setting the this, this scene so well. Um, yeah, just a little bit more on, on Mark. Mark is the founder of, of, of the Shared Value Business Management concept. And Mark, I just want to say good morning to you and welcome. You know, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for your support the last is it almost four years now that we've journeyed together and for always being so accessible to share your knowledge, your views and your experience. So let's talk about this wonderful concept that I believe that you and Michael put together 10 years ago, because the Shared Valley is 10 years old this year. You shared with us during the June 4th CEO Connect a little bit about your and, and, and Michael's journey. So as we roller coasting towards 2022, during a very difficult period globally, two questions for you, Mark. How do we as companies continue to create value for all of our stakeholders? And what shift have you seen in your experience in business in the last 10 years? Can you share some of your thoughts with us, please? Sure, thank you, Tiki. And, and first of all, congratulations on this forum and on uh, the, the really remarkable uh, success you've had uh, bringing this shared value concept to Africa. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think um, the concept of shared value is simply the idea of creating competitive advantage and economic success for a business by having a positive impact on society. That could be environmental, that could be social, that could be in terms of health, whatever it might be. But you know, traditionally, companies thought that social issues were irrelevant to their business, that they were externalities. And instead, we find that when companies begin to focus on the well-being of their stakeholders, when they begin to adopt a social purpose, when they begin to think about how to embrace social impact as part of their core strategy, not as something peripheral through philanthropy or CSR, 
uh, they actually become more profitable and more successful. So many things that we used to think were just a cost turn out to have real benefits to the bottom line. Just one quick example, a company in the US, a small company, manufacturing company uh, that I was uh, getting to know recently. And um, they had a very narrow profit margin, only about 3%. And in the US right now, we have difficulty uh, filling jobs. There's much more demand for uh, employees than there are uh, people willing to take the jobs. And so this company found they had to increase their wages by 30% in order to attract the employees they need. Well, the remarkable thing is when they increased the wages, they reduced the turnover of employees. They improved the productivity of employees. They helped the employees deal with their home expenses and so on in a way that meant they didn't have to work a second job and they were therefore more productive on their first job. And the result is this narrow 3% profit margin actually grew to 6% profit margin after they increased the wages. You know, traditionally, we would have thought that that would have eliminated profit, but it actually created more. We're seeing this around environmental impact where companies that are reducing their environmental footprint are more profitable. Uh, we're seeing it around um, countries uh, such as those in Africa, uh, where uh, companies traditionally have not found good ways to do business in the past, but are increasingly learning how to reach populations that they couldn't serve before, and thereby expanding their market. So overall, this idea that Professor Michael Porter and I developed a decade ago, uh, that companies actually uh, can improve their financial performance by having a positive social impact seems to be borne out in practice, both in developed nations and in emerging economies like Africa. Thank you, Mark. As you know, I, for me, it's, it's very simple because as Adela said as well, is the focus should always be on profit with purpose which leads me into, into purpose, because we as shared value advocates, we all know that purpose is the start of any shared value or social impact journey. So purpose-led and purpose-driven companies have been shown to outperform their peers over the long term. You know, I've, I've looked at a Deloitte study. I mean, it's, it's not a, it wasn't done recently, but they showed that purpose-driven companies have a higher market share gain and they grow three times faster than their competitors. I actually heard Michael say once that, that I think it's, it's a much bigger now. They outperform their competitors on a, on a scale of one to 10. Um, you know, so Mark, what are your thoughts on the importance of purpose-driven leadership? Because I think you know, for us as shared value practitioners, we, you know, we always, always want a company to define their purpose before they start their shared value journey. Otherwise, it is not going to be sustainable. So your right. thoughts. Thank you. Well, I, I, you know, several thoughts to that. Uh, I, I completely agree that purpose is important. Uh, and it has to be at the core of the company, not on the periphery. And typically, we think about purpose as being important because it motivates employees if they have a sense of purpose. And that is absolutely true. We see that again and again. If, company, if employees believe that their work is contributing to a better world, they are much more motivated than if it's just for the paycheck. But the importance of having a social purpose in business as part of your strategy goes well beyond motivating your employees. One of my favorite shared value companies uh, based in South Africa is Discovery Insurance. I think he's tired, I'm sure, of hearing me talk about discovery, but they are such a remarkable story. So it's a, it's a health insurance company, uh, that's how they started out, that developed a set of incentives and rewards for people to exercise more, eat healthier, do other things, get checkups, do other things that improve their health outcomes. And as a result of these incentives, their insured population has 15% lower medical costs, get sick less often when they're in the hospital, they get out of the hospital more quickly. And it's made for not only healthier people, but a more profitable health insurance company. But they think about not just being a health insurance company, 
but actually having a social purpose about improving people's lives in general. And that has led them into life insurance, that has led them into providing credit cards, that has led them into encouraging savings for retirement and helping to manage those savings. Most recently, it's led them into a, a new uh, cell phone app that enables you to track your own carbon footprint and improve it. And so they've cut across all these different industries. You would say, why is a health insurer offering a credit card or offering this uh, app for uh, your, your environmental footprint? Well, the answer is because they have this social purpose and because they think about the well-being of their stakeholders, it leads them to think beyond the narrow boundaries of their industry, to think about what are the other needs that these populations that are our customers have, and how can we develop new services, new products that help improve their lives. And so we see again and again that when companies adopt a sense of social purpose, it can actually redefine the industry in which they play by expanding the boundaries to take into account other dimensions that, again, can enable them to grow their business and gain competitive advantage. So, so Mark, I also have to just mention Safaricom in Kenya, because you were with me in Kenya last year. Yes, Not indeed. last year, the year before. So Safaricom right. also for, you know, their actual purpose is transforming lives. And if you have a look at what Safaricom is doing, also, it's a, it's a tele, telecom company that went into banking. Well, they, they provide Mpesa from a mobile perspective. They've got Mtiba, which is a health, um, you know, a, a health solution by your cell, cell phone where you can save money and pay your, your um, medical bills. They've got Digifarm. That's also for farmers out there. So, so um, Safaricom is also a, a really, really great, but thank you for the- I know, excellent example, I, I agree, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, 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 so let's talk a little bit about culture, innovation and equality. You know, it's been said that a culture of equality in the workplace is a powerful multiplier of innovation and growth. And there's a growing awareness also globally that workplace diversity drives innovation. You know, and, and there's also a growing body of research on the, on the business advantages of diversity. Yet, companies are still slow to adopt the culture of equality and diversity. And I think it was George Serafim in, the, in a Harvard Business Review that said, if organizations want to innovate and thrive, they have to get to equal. So, Mark... How easy is it for a company to get to equal, to adopt that culture of equality that can motivate innovation? Because we know how close culture and, and purpose is linked as well, you know, in our shared value world. So over to yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Tiki. And, and of course, indeed, culture is uh, essential to being able to put purpose into practice in a company. And culture is one of the biggest determinants of how successful a company will be. You know, I wish I could say we've made terrific progress toward equality, uh, both in terms of uh, race and in terms of gender. Uh, but in fact, the progress is very, very slow and very limited. Um, it is absolutely true that companies that perform better on gender diversity or racial diversity outperform other companies. And it's, uh, understandable why. Uh, it's not just a question of culture, it's also a question of understanding your customer. You know, time and again, we see companies fail because they're innovating to develop products that don't meet the actual needs and preferences of customers. And the way you can be sure that your products and services will meet the needs of your customers is by having employees who look like your customers and think like your customers. And so if you want to sell products to women, you need to have women in leadership positions at the company. Uh, if you want to sell products uh, to different uh, ethnic groups, you need to have those groups represented in the leadership of the company. You know, we all have blind spots where we don't recognize, we can't see what other people see 
it's inevitable just based on who we are, our background, our attitudes, etc. And there's no way around those blind spots except to have other people with different blind spots uh, alongside us so that they cancel each other out. Uh, and so we've, we've come to see that it, it is indeed a matter of culture and people are more motivated when they feel that their efforts are rewarded regardless of their race or gender. But it's also a question of smart marketing. You can't serve a market that you don't understand. And I have come to see for myself that as a white male uh, based in the US, there are many things I don't understand uh, and markets I could not possibly serve uh, without having a diverse team to lead the effort. So I think, you know, Mark, for diversity, I almost feel that every single CEO that's listening today is diversity needs to be almost top of your, of, of your agenda. So, so we spoke about equality now and you touched also on gender equality. You know, and we as the Shared Value Africa believe that gender equality can be an economic game changer, not just for Africa, but globally. So, so what I want to ask our team to do is to just play, Mark, allow me, indulge me a little bit to play this 50 second video to show to our audience and to you how big this game changer can be if we actually, you know, get gender equality right. So Lolo, can I ask you to play it for us, please? To those who think gender equality only benefits girls, the numbers tell a different story. If US companies hired and promoted women at the same rate as countries like Norway, the economy could grow by 8%. Around the world, gender diverse companies are 15% likelier to earn more than their competitors. And just by adding more women to the workforce, the global GDP could go up by 26%. In India alone, women could grow the economy by up to 60%. And in the last 20 years, the revenue of women owned US companies has increased by 103%. Yeah. It pays for us to have a bigger piece of the pie. So yeah, I just I thought it would be it would be good to to share that video just to show you know what the real figures look like. So um, because I think sadly, even after five years of the SDGs almost now. The higher we go up, as you just mentioned also earlier on, Mark, the higher we go up the corporate ladder, the fewer women we see. I was looking at stats released by Catalyst Inc. on women in S&P 500 companies. I think we still only have 5.8% uh, female CEOs. Only 11% of them are part of the top earners. 21.2% have got board seats and it just carries on and on. So it's still a pretty unequal picture, you know, out there. So, so just, just Mark, if you can maybe just share why, why, why do you think that our leadership or just some thoughts from you on why, why do we find it so difficult to implement gender equality? Because I even last year, we did as the SEAI, we did research last year in the financial services sector on this on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and it was it was astounding to see even JSE listed companies that didn't actually have women in that in in you know in on more so in that middle level of the actual leaders that are running the company on a day to day basis. So, what some thoughts from you on that? Yeah, and uh, you know, it is uh, really disappointing to see the slow pace at which things are changing. You know, I, I talked earlier about blind spots, and one of the consequences of the blind spots that we all have is that we tend to want to hire people who are similar to us. We're most comfortable working with people who are similar to us. And so if you have a male-dominated uh, uh, leadership team, uh, it's very natural for them to hire more men and not to 
think to hire women, not to trust or recognize that women can be as productive or more productive than men. And so these things are very hard to change. You know, there are some legislations that have been passed in the US, in California in particular, any publicly traded company that's based in California has to have women on their board of directors. And that's made a real difference. We have seen a significant increase in the number of women on boards of directors. So I often find that to really make change, there has to be a mandate that requires it. And it's not because people are so determined to uh, avoid hiring women or anything like that. Again, it's, it's really the natural consequence of people's blind spots and tendency to hire and be comfortable working with people who look like themselves. You know, the other factor, of course, is that the progress of a woman's career is often different than a man's career because of the constraints of getting pregnant, having children, raising a family. And so women go in and out of the workforce over the course of their career in a way that men often do not. And we have not adjusted our working environment or our career expectations uh, to equalize the impact of that on the promotion uh, of women to more senior positions. Because they have a more interrupted work life in many cases, it's very, very hard uh, for them to rise through the ranks to senior positions. And in, in fact, um, if they don't have an interrupted career, uh, the likelihood is that they're working twice as hard because they have responsibilities at home on top of the responsibilities of their job. Uh, so we really have, have just not done a good job of creating a, a work environment and a promotion and advancement model that truly meets the needs of women. I think, I think Mark, what you're saying is unless you make it policy, you know, and unless you reinforce it, you enforce it, we are never going to get there. And, and yes, you know, the, the whole idea of shared value, Tiki, as you well know, is voluntary effort by companies yeah. to create a positive impact, to address social problems and needs uh, in a way that encourages their success. And we see example after example of it, but we also see that a majority of companies in the world are still not thinking that way and that change comes very, very slowly, uh, particularly in larger companies. There is a real reluctance to take the risk of moving in new directions. And uh, as a result, the kinds of changes that we want to see and the kinds of changes that would in fact improve the performance of the company rarely happen without a policy mandate that requires it. And then companies, grumble about having to comply with the mandate and then find that the results are actually better as a result of it to their surprise. Yeah, yeah I, th I think what you, you know, I, I definitely share your thoughts because I think in our three, three and a half years working in, in Africa and trying to shift mindsets and to trying, you know, to, to, to get the leaders out there to just look at the shared value model it's, it's, been, it's been a struggle because I think people always think there's an enormous risk involved rather than looking at it from a long-term perspective. Because as you know, you more so than me because you've been at it for 10 years, I mean, the long-term results, you know, of adopting a shared value profit with purpose strategy actually can, you know, can create long-term sustainability and long-term shareholder value and stakeholder value as well. So um... absolutely. Uh, and and you know you mentioned the long term and that's right. And one of the problems we see particularly in the US is this focus on short-term uh, performance. Uh, and of course you have to have short-term performance, but you also have to focus on long-term opportunities. And far too many large companies in this country are focused only on the short term. I was interviewing a CEO the other day who said, who admitted that, you know, we don't really do strategy, we do financial planning because we're really only looking two or three years out. And there are far too many companies that have confused financial planning with strategy and don't have a longer term vision. 
Absolutely. I think you, when you were with me in, in Nairobi in 2019, you met a really, really great man called Bob Collymore from yes. Storycom that we, that we sadly lost uh, after the yes. summit that year. And he always said in his meetings, in his financial meetings, even Stephen Cheke from Safaricom shared it with us at the JSE as well. When they go into their meet, into their financial meetings, they look at the social impact first before they even look at the financial figures. And wouldn't that be great if we can get all companies to to, to work like that? It really would be, don't you think, Mark? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Again, you know, we so many company leaders think that the social impact is is a burden, is an obligation, is a cost that somehow is going to make their business worse uh, or that it is something they have to deal with just in terms of their public relations or their image. And they miss so many opportunities to innovate in their core business model by tackling social needs in a way that uh, aligns with their business and that really moves them into new directions that their competitors miss. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Mark, one thing that we all struggle with, I remember you and Mervyn King's talking about it last year in December as well, is the measurements. That yeah. is one of the biggest, biggest challenges from a shared value perspective. And we, we get, you know, that question gets put to us all of the time, you know, as well. So, so what are you thinking about it? How can we make it easier? Because people tend to think, you know, that measuring social impact you know, is there's so many different, you know, systems that you can use. You know, there's the GRI, there's the SDGs. I mean, Mervyn has got his, the, you know, their reporting, the integrated reporting. So how do we as shared value practitioners, you know, measure our impact? I, I don't know if you have the golden answer for us, but maybe give us a few insights. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I have the golden answer, but I, I'll say that the the prevailing models for measuring social impact out there don't work. So you mentioned ESG reporting and ESG reporting environmental social governance is typically a very long checklist of voluntary disclosures by companies. And so we see first companies tend to avoid disclosing bad news. And since it's voluntary, they don't have to. And so the measurements of ESG are not really comparable across companies because companies choose and cherry pick what they want to disclose. Secondly, it's this very long checklist of every possible social and environmental impact that a company might have. And most of those impacts are not material to the success of the business. And frankly, most of those impacts are not where the company is having the biggest impact in the world. So instead of thinking about an ESG checklist, Companies, we believe, need to focus on what are the one or two or three most important social and environmental impacts that they have. And then how do we track and measure those and take those into account as we're developing our strategy and operations for the company? The other uh, place where social impact measurement has developed has been in the nonprofit and NGO sector where charitable foundations and NGOs want to measure the impact of their programs. And what has evolved in that space is a sense that you need to do a very structured randomized control trial to prove that a particular intervention caused a certain social impact. And the problem with that is these randomized control trials take years and are extremely expensive and you can't run a business waiting for the results of a five-year randomized control trial, nor can you afford to spend the money to be doing this. So what business needs to do to measure social impact is not what the nonprofit sector, the NGO sector wants to do, and is not what the ESG reporting requirements want to do. It is to focus in on where your social impact connects with the profitability and competitive positioning of your company and to identify just that handful of issues. And if you focus on that handful of issues, it turns out it's not hard to measure progress at all. If you are trying to improve the incomes of a certain population, measure the income. If you're trying to reduce the carbon footprint, 
measure the carbon footprint. If you're trying to increase life expectancy, measure life expectancy. The things you need to measure are really just as straightforward, in many cases easier than actually getting to measure your profit bottom line. And so I think that the key is to ignore the way NGOs think about measurement, to ignore ESG ratings, and instead to focus in on the most material impacts for your company and the simplest, least expensive, timeliest way to measure the impact. I think you're so right because we tend to go and look at all of the different uh, you know, reporting systems out there and then we try and align with it rather than you know, finding the simplest way because that's what we tend to do. We try and, you know, Try, rather than going the simple route, we go the most difficult one. So, but Mark, I want to say, ask you, um, also just one thing that I want to remind everybody about out there, there as well, is that first and foremost, shared value is about profitability. It's about a profitable, a, a profitable solution to, to um, look at a social issue that's holding your business back because that's what something you've taught me actually <laughs> when I was in your class so so and, and and it's never because I think we still sometimes get that confusion between corporate social investment and corporate social responsibility but just a reminder to everybody on this call today that that it is about profit with purpose but Mark in closing I want to ask you for a very special message today for Africa. You said on June the 4th that Africa could become the shared value continent of the future because we're young, you know, we have a very young continent. And for me, when you said that on June the 4th, it was like music to my ears as that's part of our vision. So, so I'm hoping that- yeah, Absolutely, you know, <laughs> sooner or later, uh, Africa is going to be one of the dominant economic forces in the world. Uh, it's, it's going to be true because of the population growth and the youth of the population. It's going to be true because of the natural resources that Africa has. It's going to be true because as we need to grow more food, Africa is one of the most fertile places in the world to grow it. Um, however you look at it, the advances that have been made in the last decade or two by China or India are bound to happen in Africa, I believe. Uh, each country, of course, is different. Uh, the way the advances will happen will be different, uh, but I believe that they will happen and Africa indeed will become one of the dominant economic forces in the world. And what's exciting to me is, that, is the opportunity to leapfrog the steps that other countries have gone through. So, you know, we know that Africa has gone to cell phones instead of putting in landlines, and that has enabled Africa to advance much more quickly. Uh, in power generation, uh, Africa is many rural areas, distributed areas. It is a natural place for solar and wind and hydro energy instead of fossil fuel power plants. And again, Africa has a tremendous opportunity to leapfrog the rest of the world that is struggling to get out of fossil fuel power plants by skipping over them altogether and going directly to renewable energy, which is now cheaper than fossil fuel generated energy. And I think in terms of shared value, we see companies that have formed their business models all around the world, ignoring the social environmental impact that they have, struggling to readapt their strategy to bring this shared value thinking into the company. And my hope is that the opportunity in Africa is that uh, companies will be able to leapfrog here too and build businesses from the ground up that take into account issues of diversity in their workforce, issues around the environmental impact they have, and issues around how their company can contribute to the well being of the citizens, the regions where it operates, in ways that strengthen its competitive advantage. So I think there's a wonderful opportunity for Africa to really embrace shared value thinking and leapfrog much of the rest of the world in doing so. Thank you for that, Mark. It's music to my ears. As uh, Adelaira said earlier on, I'm also an Afro-optimist Afro and I absolutely love this continent. So I want to say 
thank you very much for spending the time with us. I'm, I know you're going to stay with us on the panel discussion, and I want to say to our CEOs um, that's going to be part of it, Jeremy, Shamil, Richard, Nicole, Racy, you know, if you mark there, you know, have a discussion with Mark because we want it to be a relaxed discussion between CEOs and thought leaders as to, you know, where can we take this conversation on innovation? How can we scale? And how can we bring equality and more so gender equality into the, into the workplace? So thank you very much for this conversation, Mark. And uh, I think I'm going to go off camera. You're probably going to stay on. Fifi is going to come back. And then our panel is going to come on. So thank you very, very much for, for, for this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to uh, the both of you. I think that uh, myself and everyone who has been listening to that conversation uh, can certainly say that they were blown away. Uh, Dickie, thanks so much for emphasizing the uh, importance that shared value is in essence about creating profits and about looking at the issues that are holding your profit back and uh, ensuring that your profit is increased with purpose. I love the examples that both of you cited with companies that are just doing that and that are benefiting from that. Uh, Mark, looking at the discovery model uh, that uh, ultimately uh, set out to uh, create a, a, a healthier people and has benefited significantly from that in terms of the bottom line. And Dickie citing Safaricom, which again went out uh, to, to, to address the issue of a financial inclusion, and we've seen that growth in scale. But I do wonder whether the companies that have been doing or uh, following the status quo uh, within their organizations of you know, looking at profits and looking at social impact as a periphery issue uh, might uh, face some difficulty in overhauling their systems. And therefore, with that difficulty, where does one begin to look at social impact, not as a sideline issue, but rather as being a core business strategy? Hopefully, this is also a, a conversation that uh, we can tackle in the uh, panel discussion that is uh, coming up. And uh, in fact, let me actually introduce you to the uh, thought leaders that will uh, be helping us uh, scale the uh, conversation around innovating and innovating uh, with uh, equality. Uh, starting with uh, Shamil Yusuf, who is the CEO of the Vodacom Group and also an executive director there. Shamil also sits on the board of Safaricom and was appointed to the Vodafone Group XO, XCO in April last year. He's also a board member of the South African Business Lobby Group, Business Leadership South Africa. We also have Racy Muchilua, country president. Is Shamil there? Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon, afternoon, sorry. Afternoon, great to, great to see you. We've got Racy Muchilua, the country president and head of Novartis Sub-Saharan Africa, leading 46 countries. Racy has over 20 years of experience in the pharmaceuticals industry across different multinationals. She's a recipient of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development 2020, leading women awards for exemplary, exemplary leadership during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, good afternoon, Racy. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to be here. Hi, ma'am. Uh, we have with us Jeremy Owori, the CEO of APSA Kenya. He has an extensive career in banking, among them the uh, former CEO of Standard Chartered Tanzania. Jeremy is a board member of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance and the former chairman of the Kenya Bankers Association. He's also a YPO member and a fellow of the Aspen Global Leadership Institute. And at the thick of the COVID-19 crisis in March last year, Jeremy was appointed by the president of Kenya as a board member of the COVID-19 Emergency Response Fund. Hi there, Jeremy. Hi, glad to be here. Uh, wonderful to have you. Uh, Nicole Yembra is also with us, CEO of Chrysalis in Nigeria. Nicole founded Chrysalis Co., which houses the Chrysalis Capital, a $15 million African tech fund, and the Chrysalis Advisors, which is a financial investment and strategy firm. Nicole is a member of the inaugural Obama Foundation uh, Leaders, Africa Class, and serves on the Council of Eight for the show, the Shared Value Africa Initiative. She is also a mentor for Google Launchpad, and her vision is to support African tech companies building globally relevant institutions. Afternoon, Nicole. 
afternoon. Uh, great to have you. And last but not least, we've got Richard Firth, the CEO of MIP Holdings, which is a software engineering company that supplies systems to the financial services industry. Richard is a stalwart of the South African technology industry. He's also held uh, numerous board positions and provided mentorship for technology startups. He is an advisor to NASDAQ listed multinational software and database company with uh, customers around the uh, globe. Richard, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for the invite, Fifi. Nice to be right. here. Wonderful. All the uh, formalities aside, let's get to talking. And I'd like to uh, begin by asking the, the panel just to share their view of the topic of discussion today and also maybe uh, tell us exactly how you are tackling the the challenge to innovate uh, with scale and also equality within your respective organizations. Uh, Racy, if I can start with you. Thank you so much, Fifi. And uh, Mark and Tiki actually created a very good foundation for what I'm going to speak about. And um, the topic of shared value, innovation and equality is something that's very critical for the success of Africa. And it's something as Novartis where we've been very intentional to ensure that we are reaching what we need to reach, changing the strategies across the organization to ensure that we are reaching the patients that we need to reach. And I'll give an example. Our company mission is to reimagine medicine to improve and extend people's lives. That is the company mission for Novartis. Novartis Sub-Saharan Africa has gone even further and this is our mandate we all discussed from a strategy perspective to see how do we make it a business with purpose by ensuring that we are touching the people who are most affected, who are the patients. So we are, we are on a very ambitious journey and we have set a very bold aspiration of doubling our patient numbers by next year, 2022, and quintupling the patient numbers times five by 2025. But even before I talk about outside, if we are talking about within, it's great to also just mention that Novartis is part of the group, uh, the companies that actually signed the EPIC pledge, which then signs more to us pay equity. And how do we then place our leadership to ensure that we are having a 50-50 approach from a leadership perspective in terms of gender? We're on track of that. And I'll talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, where the gender ratio is 44% to 66%. We're on a journey. This epic pledge by 2023, we should have reached there at 50-50. But also looking at it from an age perspective is also critical to, to see how then we incorporate the age aspect. The average age within my business unit is 38 years old across the business unit. And from that roughly 65% of them are millennials. What does that mean? It means then when we're coming up with strategies, whether it's the way we retain talent, retain people, whether it's the way we approach out, those are some of the things that we need to consider as a company and see what do we need to do and be very intentional in terms of how we approach, how we manage both internally and externally. And how do we improve the lives of people in? By making sure from a capacity, capability building, they're aware they need to be well positioned to perform very well. How do we extend their lives? By making sure then they're very clear on their career plan within mm -hmm. Novartis. Outside is a bit different. And I'll give some of the examples that we've done outside, uh, out of the externally from an innovation perspective. In, on 23rd of November, and I, I think some of our colleagues on the call might be attending the, the launch. We are launching what we call Novartis Biome Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. a one-stop innovative ecosystem on the continent with the aim of creating an environment where innovative solutions to some of the most complex access challenges can be sourced incubated and also distributed. Some of the things we are focusing on is innovative finance, patient early diagnosis access, supply chain, how do the patients, how do our medicines reach the patient down at the village? Because that's part of inclusivity, that's part of equality. How do we make sure the patient where I was born in the Western part of Kenya, in the village, can access Novartis products? And also how do we make sure then the healthcare, the, the healthcare worker, it has the right education to be able to manage these patients. Those, those are some of the things that we're doing. And we are hoping right. that we should be able to manage some of the staff across the way. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Then just allow me to say one more thing, Fifi. If you look at the ratio of doctors to patients within 
within Africa. We have some cases where we have one doctor to 10,000 patients in some of the countries. That's not acceptable. WHO recommendation is one doctor to 1,000 patients. What can we do as an industry to make sure that we are reaching those patients in the fastest way possible? Uh, and, and the patients, we create the right infrastructure to support also those doctors, not only with information, but also with the right diagnostic tools for them to be able to diagnose some of these patients, some of these uh, diseases. So we are committed on that, that we are imagining medicine to improve and extend people's lives. And we believe that's a shared value across all humanity. And we are not only looking at profits, but looking at how many patients can we reach and run a sustainable business at the end of the day. So that has to have a balance for sure. Uh, certainly. I mean, and especially as, I mean, access to healthcare and basic healthcare is a human right, right? Um, yes. But as you do uh, mention, uh, quite a number of uh, people on the continent don't even have that basic benefit. Very interesting to hear the amount of work that is uh, going on there at Novartis Racy and also the uh, big targets that uh, the organization has uh, set itself in achieving. But uh, Shamil, let's uh, uh, shift over to uh, telecoms and uh, what is happening within your a respective organization. So uh, with regard to uh, the topic uh, for today, uh, what's Vodacom doing? Yeah, uh, so thank you, Vivi. I think, um, firstly, we start off with uh, a clear goal across our operations, which is really connecting for a better future. So in that respect, what we, what we have done and are doing is firstly establishing a social contract with government uh, in each of the markets that we operate in to, to really try and drive the, the uh, goals of government. And of course, that fits in quite nicely with, uh, with the UN SDG goals as well. Um, and uh, COVID, of course, gave us an opportunity to live that purpose and to live our purpose as well. And I think, I, you know, I can confidently say that we stood out as one of the companies across Africa that have really played a big part uh, on, uh, on COVID and dealing with the impacts. Mm -hmm. So an example, the platform that's being used to roll out the vaccines in South Africa um, is, um, is a platform that we built um, and, and really is being used to, to distribute it. And in partnership with other NEPED, uh, we now you know, have offered that to all uh, African states to be able to utilize the platform. So that's, that's the one part, but I think also some of the decisions we made in things like in PESA, uh, as an example, where I don't think there's a better way of creating more shared value. Uh, today, we process $25 billion of transactions across the continent. Um, uh, and so, so it's quite material. Uh, mm -hmm. During COVID, many of the governments approached us to zero rate um, uh, at PESA. We stepped up, we zero rated it. Um, and um, you know what, what happened is, the shared value came by providing that we put communities first. Mm -hmm. But you know, I say sometimes when you're doing good, you get benefits in other ways. What actually happened is it caused a bigger form of digitization and more people actually mm -hmm. adopting the platform. So it came back in a different form. But the real reason we did it was to put to to to, to put communities first uh, during during the period of uh, of COVID, and then. You know, virtual doctors, um, uh, platforms that we created, and really, um, you know, how, giving phones to health workers and so on and so on. There's a number of different initiatives across markets that have that have really helped. So, you know, um, uh, basically, our social agenda is very, very strong in terms of what we're doing. But I think going beyond that, and how the question that you're posing about how do you innovate to create shared value, um, I think. The first thing in PESA gives you a fantastic platform from which to do that. Um, in that, you know, we, we're starting to innovate and now we're going to super apps. So in South Africa, we've just soft launched our new super app, which is uh, officially launching in the next couple of weeks for voter pay. But, um, and that will be the future of in PESA as well. Uh, and the whole concept, uh, it uses the Alipay technology and what Alipay managed to achieve in China was to allow small entities to embrace uh, e-commerce and really sell their products beyond the geographical area and open up the platforms from where, where today we deal with a few to dealing with many businesses and small businesses being able to create products. So we see that as creating shared value of how to empower businesses. We've done the same with merchants today. We have 
450,000 merchants across the continent uh, signed up. Now what we're doing is extending loans, business advances, being able to connecting them directly with FMCG so they can order through our platforms and so on. So mm -hmm. it's use of platforms that can help you to achieve that. So that's one example. A second one is through our company called Mezzanine, which is the one that's empowering the, um, uh, the distribution of vaccines. But the same company is also developing uh, platforms for female farming, uh, as an example. And we have a DigiFarm initiative in Kenya uh, with Safaricom, and we have uh, different initiatives, a female farming initiative in South Africa, where we're taking female farmers and empowering them by training them uh, on the one side, but then also taking out the middlemen and allowing them to sell directly uh, uh, to, to big buyers. And, and this is how you create uh, shared value. Then of course, uh, in our other big one called IoT.next, uh, we've built a platform where we can take out power consumption or reduce power consumption by 20 to 30%. So now we're talking about shared value as it relates to environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that respect, uh, you know, that those services are now being rolled out across the continent, but also that tech is being utilized in Europe and, in, and as far afield as California now, where our services are being sold. Uh, what's interesting is it's creating a lot of uh, local jobs as well, uh, but it's the use of those, it's empowering. This was a small company which, you know, uh, by joining the Vodacom uh, group, we've now managed to, to empower. And I think that's where shared value is also going to come from, is encouraging more big companies to partner with small ones. And so we're trying to create a multitude of different platforms that actually speaks to this economic transformation and really creates, uh, 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 creates uh, shared value. And then uh, lastly, I would say to our social agenda across the continent, inviting partners to partner with us to drive things like more coverage uh, across the continent. So we've created a program now, we're beyond our normal budgets and rollouts and so on, that we can cover 10,000 small towns which would never have been covered before, or would have taken a long time to cover. And we're inviting partners to partner with us uh, to, to be able to take it because we're not the only beneficiaries when we take that coverage out there. The OTTs, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, they all benefit from this. So, it, you know, now we're looking for partnerships uh, to be able to do that. Developmental funds are willing to partner with us in creating um, the, this, uh, this uh, connectivity. And with that connectivity comes the access to the internet, comes the ability for people to connect. And yeah. it's part of our initiative to, to, to make sure that there's 3.7 billion people who remain unconnected today. 3.4 billion um, are close to connectivity, but are not taking full advantage of it. So what we're trying to build is that capability where we can we can take full advantage uh, of that going forward. All right. All right. Now, again, uh, a lot on the go, uh, Shamil, and it's uh, quite sad that it did take a, a crisis to the magnitude of COVID-19 to uh, show, you know, what, what could be done. As you did mention, I mean, you and I uh, in the same country here in South Africa, we did see the uh, telecoms players uh, like yourselves uh, stepping up to ensure that, I mean, kids who couldn't attend the schools could uh, still uh, learn online and those who couldn't go to the uh, hospitals could uh, uh, access some form of, of of, of medical treatment online as well. And I like how you have highlight, highlighted that the provision of these free services has actually opened up another window of opportunity uh, for, for the group. And uh, I would also just add that a lot more uh, work needs to be done. You cited the numbers of people who don't have connectivity. I think in uh, least developed countries, it's one in five uh, people have access to the internet. Just speaking to a real problem there that needs to be solved to, to address an issue of inequality. But Jeremy, I'd like to come to you. Uh, we heard earlier from Mark, he uh, mentioned blind spots. 
on how, because of blind spots, uh, sort of you had a, a status quo of business as usual continuing. And I think that what has happened in the recent while is telecoms players like Vodacom have exposed the, the blind spots of the banking industry by uh, tapping into and giving a people that never had a financial identity or a financial digital identity, bringing them into, into that fold. But just uh, your take on that, uh, but more importantly, uh, what, what you as APSA as an organization are doing to drive inequality and innovation or drive equality rather and innovation at scale? Yeah, firstly, um, I think it's great to be part of this conversation with such um, dis you know, distinguished leaders across the continent. I mean, the way we, we uh, look at um, innovation is that we, we, we believe, like the other panelists, that we have a responsibility as a, as a systemically important company in Kenya to actually solve societal problems. Um, and we're not just looking for short-term or medium-term gains, but we're looking for sustainable long-term impact. Um, and I think when it comes to the issue of financial inclusion, um, if we're honest, I think the banks um, weren't uh, as innovative as they could have been. And when, when we saw um, the, the coming into being of mobile telephony, um, we saw leapfrogging. Firstly, landlines became irrelevant. So anyone who was doing, dealing with land telephone lines, which were hard to get, they were, they were no longer relevant. And we, we had something like 200,000 lines among 40 million people, and it's gone to maybe 300,000 lines. So banking also fell into that trap. Um, once the cost of getting a mobile phone and data bundles in there opened up the opportunity for mobile wallets, people could store value, people could do transactions. Um, and what we've, what we've seen is with the increasing use of technology, we've tried to see how can we partner with telecom providers who have access to millions of clients to provide value added services. And I, and I think partnerships like Shamil has talked about are essential in doing this. So we've partnered with Safaricom, um, which is a Vodacom uh, subsidiary um, within Kenya. And we've done many interesting things. So one of the things we did is we, uh, like he mentioned during the COVID crisis, we felt it's important that we give people access to moving their money around between bank accounts to their wallet and their wallet uh, to bank accounts. And we waived those fees. And we saw a drastic uptick um, you know, in the services being used. And that will hang over way into, uh, way post the crisis once, once, it, once it settles. The other thing we've done is we partnered with them uh, to launch a, a mobile app, which, which relies on a lot of data in terms of um, whether it's mobile usage, data usage, et cetera. Um, and that app, basically what it allows is a, a person to open, to get the app, open a mobile wallet, um, like bank account essentially, within a minute, yeah, using their national ID. They've got this account. They can actually get a loan within another minute or so thereafter from not having any account. And that just because of the infrastructure that we have available. Now, the impact that we had of launching this partnership was that we were able to onboard a million clients in less than 40 days. And then we moved to 5 million clients within a year. And using this technological platform and partnership, what you can now do is you can borrow money online, whether it's for a day, a week, a month, three months. You can actually save money and get extremely competitive rates that you couldn't get before using the power of many with some of the products we've launched. You can buy insurance, micro insurance that can help manage risks, whether it be medical and help your financial stability, among many other things, including transit, transferring money and making payments. And I think this is the power of technology, really to be able to make it easy for customers to get about their business rather than worrying about banking. We recognize that people, it's not people love to do banking. They do banking because they need to do banking. And we need to make it as convenient as possible and include as many people into the financial system as possible because now we can mobilize deposits and actually lend them on to people who have that need. And we've seen that working very well with our SME customers. We have many customers who are essentially like day traders. They buy stock in the morning, they sell it in the evening. Before they were struggling with getting access to finance. With our platforms, now they can get that access to finance without talking to anybody. They can just use it on the phone. And I think we're seeing a lot of technology now revolving around data, data analytics, yeah, 
which allows us to see trends that were nothing to do with maybe simple things like income, your salary, when you were paid. Um, and we're doing a lot more correlations there. So we look at technology as how can we solve these problems? How do we use the, the ever increasing skill sets um, and technological platforms to be able to, uh, you know, to manage this? And we see huge opportunities in this, uh, in this area going forward. Yeah. Uh, I certainly uh, could not but help but notice the smile on your face as you were talking about all these opportunities to accelerate further inclusion. Um, and I must at this point just uh, remind the panelists, I think that we all got the brief that the opening remarks uh, should be limited to three minutes. I myself got so excited, I forgot to remind the uh, previous speakers and this of course, so much to say on this topic. So I'm going to really ask Nicole and Richard uh, to tow us in line. And the second round of questions, I'm going to take a couple of minutes uh, from the uh, prior speakers that I, I, I gave too much of before. But Nicole, just to uh, bring you in here, really as the uh, face of this continent, uh, by representing essentially the uh, biggest assets we have right now, our, our, our huge youth demographic and the potential huge dividend that it can yield if we, if we play things right. But uh, uh, talk to us about uh, your thoughts of the theme and how you are trying to impact uh, change in your space. Thank you, Fifi. Um, it's been really great listening to everyone talk and, you know, large CEOs, large organizations when my work is building the technology companies that either partner with you guys or beat you guys one day. Um, so we'll see how that <laughs> works. <laughs> um, but, you know, here, what we've been doing, and I view innovation, it can only really be driven first by private sector, but also by people living and breathing in those problems, right? So I think about some of my companies like Helium Health, who, you know, started looking at, we talk about healthcare data. Um, they have over, you know, a million patient data now, but they were then tapped by Lagos State during the pandemic to not only create the platform that runs testing through um, the country. So if you're entering Nigeria and you go on a platform, that platform is built and run by Helium Health. Um, you know, it's also helping with vaccine uh, delivery um, and also just what Helium has been able to do um, using healthcare technology, right, to be able to reach a lot more people. So how they're innovating and how they're able to, you know, kind of push and drive that change um, is another one of companies we're supporting. And even looking at Rensource, Nigeria, they said, you know, it's like less than 50% of the country is connected to the grid. Um, and it's almost impossible because it's billions of dollars to be able to connect most people to power and power is what you need to run your telco towers. Power is what you need to run, you know, like all the banking, et cetera, like you need power. Um, so their focus has been on creating microgrids starting in these markets. And not only are those grids, you know, powering SMEs um, in one of the markets in Nigeria, it's over 11,000 SMEs and their goal is 250,000 of these SMEs um, in the next five years. And it's not only powering them, increasing jobs um, on those things, but it's also helping to reduce like CO2 emission because obviously it's, it's renewable energy power. So it's much larger scale impact. Um, and for our financial inclusion piece, we have, you know, 22 commercial banks, 300, 400 microfinance banks, but yet our banked population is less than 50%. Um, so our, our companies like your crowd forces, your bank leads, they're building out these agent networks to bring a lot more people into the system, right? Um, and so they've been able to go into these places that traditional big banks can't really reach, but then still partner and connect in, in those rails. Um, and so as we kind of view innovation, I'm like, it is driven by the really young people that are in that system. And, and my job is to help them think about shared value from the beginning, right? So when you're building your team, is that team diverse? Um, most of the people in our portfolio, they're either female co-founded or they bring a woman onto the management team. So I think that's really critical. And I can make that check and that gut because I'm giving them money, I'm helping them build a company. You can kind of make that something that's top of mind from the very beginning of you investing in a company and helping them grow. Um, you're also able to help them think about how this is impacting their communities, how they can restructure their businesses. It's a lot easier when the company is a couple months to a couple years old versus it's this large institution. And so if you make it part of their DNA in the beginning, it's something that they continue to think about as they grow and they scale. So, you know, that's kind of how I view my role in being able to help support a lot of these innovative tech companies um, on the continent and how as they go from one stage or another, centering shared value. Wonderful. And again, just speaking to the point of the importance of 
uh, having a shared value at the beginning, right? Uh, as you did mention, uh, making it part of the uh, company's DNA. And it brings the question in my mind again as to, you know, you've got these companies that have been existing and doing things the way that they've been doing for donkey's years. And how do you get these donkeys to, to, to change their ways? I think that we've spoken quite extensively on innovation and the various innovations that are happening within your organizations. And uh, we'll uh, come back to that in just a moment. But I thought right now, maybe we just dive into the a challenge around equality. Uh, and uh, Racy, if you're still with us, I'd like to maybe get your thoughts on equality. And uh, certainly, uh, given the uh, fact that there is a huge correlation between societies that are a lot more equal uh, with societies that are a lot more digitally transformed. And therefore, in the issue of trying to address equality, I'd like to find out from you, Racy, if um, the role of the private sector in addressing uh, gender equality and creating gender equality, uh, how do you think that the private sector is faring in that regard and what more can they do? Uh, thank you, Fifi. Um, looking, uh, as I said initially, it has to be an intentional approach by the organization and not just to tick a box. Because a lot of us then we decide, yes, this is a good to have and we'll talk about it. But when you go on the ground, really nothing is happening, but it's a great topic to put in board discussions. We have to be very intentional about it. And one of the things I always mention, even to my team, I would not want to be given a role because I'm a woman. I would like to be given a role because I'm competitive, just like the next person. But having said that, as a leader myself, then I need to make sure there are policies within the within within my company that supports that initiative. So that if I'm saying that I'm looking at 50-50, what is this policy that will support me towards this? I'm making sure that we are giving equal opportunity to everybody, but probably with a bit of bias towards this and pulling some of the people to come in and make sure that they're on the table, they raise their hand because a lot of times you find the female gender, they would not raise their hand for some of the roles. And it's, from my experience, what I've noticed is from a commitment perspective, I find a lot more commitment from the females than in, compared to the male and not in any way to say that they're not as committed, but it's more of probably there's a deeper purpose. And I'll, I'll just draw back to what I said initially. When we're talking about our purpose within Novati Sub-Saharan Africa is to reach as many patients as possible. When you look at the person who really gets very, very hard when the daughter is sick, when the son is sick, when the husband is sick, when the family is sick, it's normally the mother whom you'd see quite affected. So it's a matter of seeing then, how do we empower this woman to be able to take care of the family, but also not only at that social level, but even at the work level. So it has to be really, really a balance that needs to be done, but all companies in the private sector have to be really intentional to make sure that they have those statistics that will help achieve that. All right, it is a balance uh, and uh, we need to be intentional. I'd like to also apologize on my part. I mean, we're talking about equality and I have just, and inclusivity rather, and I have just uh, excluded uh, one of our panelists, uh, Richard, uh, so sorry about that. So if I can just come to you, so just to, to get your thoughts. Uh, on the uh, theme for today and also uh, your, your organization, how you are trying to address some of the uh, social ills. Uh, thank you, thank you, Fifi. I'm, I'm humbled to be here. Um, in, the, in the words of Peter Diamandis, co-founder of Singularity University, we live in a world of abundance. So I actually agree and I think that technology is just another resource to drive abundance. Solutions are out there for every problem that we face although we have to choose to find the right solution and not necessarily the quick solution. In our drive for quadruple bottom line reporting, we decided to take on a major tech industry challenge when dealing with a goal of purpose. Our conundrum was that the South African software industry has a dire shortage of software engineers, yet there's also a global shortage. And amazingly, we have a 34.4% unemployment rate. It just doesn't make sense. So firstly, to fix the problem, we could simply have thrown the proverbial money at the problem. We could have very well have gone to India where there's an abundance of software engineers. Just ask yourself how many large corporates have actually followed the strategy. Secondly, if we had simply advertised the posts, we would have landed up with tens of thousands of people not fit for the role and without the skill, but just desperate for work. 
to find the right people, we needed a mechanism that we could scale through innovation, but it must test a person's logical reasoning. We also knew that it doesn't uh, uh, take a university degree to make a software engineer, but rather thousands of people out there are born with the inheritability. We designed a flyer, it had no MIP branding, and all that was written on it was, do you want to become a software engineer? If so, then solve a riddle. And there was a short riddle on the page. By solving the riddle, it exposed a nondescript website address. The flyer was distributed to universities, technicons, and schools from Polokwane to Pinelands in South Africa. By going to the website address, it warned you you needed one hour of dedicated time, and then it led you to a game. And the game actually introduced you to more complexities as you went along. What the player was actually doing was they were writing a mini program. They were, they were instructing a robot around the screen. And we could check two criterions. We could see the time it took uh, uh, the, the, the player and, it, uh, and we could see the quality of their instructions. Um, so until this point, there was no human intervention from MIP. We just used innovation to achieve abundance at scale. We've designed a few more tests, obviously, uh, a third party psychometric or competency test. And we also do uh, a, a, an attitude test. But once we've been through this, the candidate uh, uh, started MIP on day one to be trained for four months with a salary of between 9,000 and 21,000 Rand a month. Because in the low income groups, you cannot get someone to come to work if they haven't got money. Mm -hmm. We've had a 95% success rate uh, uh, in this project. We absorbed all the candidates of which 450 highly qualified individuals have now been through the training and they all earn a very good salary. Mm -hmm. For equality, eight years ago, our objective for the internship was to select a, a minimum number of 30% black candidates coming through the process. And we struggled to meet the target eight years ago. Just this year, we now have achieved 100% black candidates in the internship. But we still had a problem because only five to 10% of the candidates were female. We focused on that issue. And now we're really happy that in the class just this month that started this month, 50% of the candidates were female. So if we focused on the conundrum and we actually went out to solve it using our skill, as you can see, we've come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pippi. No, thank you so much. And also, I mean, highlighting, again, a tangible benefit of what can happen if, you know, a, a perceived cost increase um, can actually uh, result in a, a, a material benefit, as you did mention the issue around salary. And it just reminds me about how um, difficult some companies have cited even implementing a basic minimum wage here in South Africa of uh, around 3,500, saying that it will cost them too much. Uh, perhaps it is uh, an initial cost, but uh, certainly you again have added to uh, an example that Mark uh, cited earlier on that it can actually yield an even bigger benefit long term if your focus is not on the short term. And Mark, perhaps to bring you back in, uh, so I mean, you've heard from a number of business leaders across the continent and how they are trying to create shared value. What do you make of their interventions? Well, I think it's terrific. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just delightful to, to sit back and, and hear uh, such inspired executives uh, and so many different examples of, of how this thinking can really uh, influence a company, turbocharge its growth prospects. Uh, you know, just amazing to think about uh, a million customers so quickly at Safaricom. Um, and, um, and really can change the culture of a company in ways that contribute to the bottom line. So uh, I think it just uh, it shows some wonderful real life examples of this theory in practice in Africa. Well, uh, good to have your uh, your thumbs up. Uh, perhaps I'll come back to you and ask, you know, what more can be done. But just circling back to the uh, the topic of of uh, equality and gender equality uh, specifically, but also involving other forms of equality. Uh, you know, Shamil, what what we did see in 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 South Africa 
and I think in most parts of the world, is a, another pandemic that did unfold over this uh, 18 months or so of dealing with COVID. And that is the pandemic that was described around a gender-based violence. It was a problem before, uh, but it became even more of a problem throughout, throughout the pandemic. So just talk to me about uh, gender equality and how, you know, perhaps maybe implementing it uh, better at, at, at board level can help solve what is happening uh, further down the track by way of these increased incidences of gender-based violence? Well, I think, uh, firstly, I mean, the gender-based issue, um, as you said, it, it was became more uh, prevalent uh, through COVID. Um, as the supporter of the gender-based violence uh, center in South Africa, uh, of course, it required that we, we had to further step up even more so. Uh, we've been working on gender-based violence for a couple of years now, making uh, our apps uh, available for victims so that they can reach out for help. It's a technology that you know I was part of when I was in Spain in 2011. Um, and uh, we brought that technology to South Africa and adopted it, um, uh, adopted it here. Mm -hmm. And they've been working very closely with government to, uh, to, uh, to, to tackle the problem head on. Secondly, what, what we realized is that victims are also, uh, you know, it's one thing dealing with it, but actually leaving uh, comes with its own consequences for a number uh, of, of the um, um, you know, of the, uh, of the victims, shall we say. And so what we've done is um, put 10 million into a gender-based violence uh, fund for the victims so that they can, we can try and create uh, better opportunities for them going forward so they can sustain themselves once they do leave and that there's the requisite support that they require to, to reestablish uh, their lives, if you like. So I think that's extremely uh, important and being able to play a meaningful role using technology in the space is, 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 is important as well. Furthermore, I think at the, um, within the company itself, creating gender transformation uh, and driving a, a, a gender transformation agenda is extremely important uh, as well. So in South Africa today, 50% of our exco is females. And I think that, um, you know, we, we're quite proud of that accolade as well but we're also transforming the rest of the company. Uh, we'd like to get to, you know, uh, to 50-50 to across at all levels within the company. And to that end, we've created a number of different programs. Um, one that, you know, um, I was the father of and quite proud of is a female development program where we identify high-performing female leaders uh, across, across uh, South Africa and then we bring them into a development program. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we help develop them further. Look, we also use the opportunity to recruit, to be honest. Uh, but even if we don't recruit them, they, they end up you know, leaving with a, uh, a very good uh, development program through you know, uh, uh, big universities and so on. And also have this constant engagement with Exco. Uh, as well. And we've been doing this now for the better part of uh, seven or eight years. Um, and that, that has been quite meaningful in the transformation. Um, you know, and, and, and we have, um, we also have different bursaries where, you know, creating more females in technology becomes a big focus area uh, for us. So, you know, I think we, we, we're very proud of the journey that we've embarked on, how yeah. we're influencing it from um, university level to internal upgrades, to de development programs internally, to code like a girl for kids, uh, you know, um, where are uh, um, specific um, programs we're trying to encourage from a very young age. We're running it now in October uh, to bring on, you know, a number of uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, uh, of young girls to come on and get excited about technology. Mm -hmm. And really that will help to drive the STEM agenda as well. So I think you know, having this fully integrated approach, um, including, you know, females wanting to return to work after long periods out. We've created a specific uh, a program uh, uh, for that um, as well. So I think when you have a fully integrated program, it, mm -hmm. you, you start to see the benefit coming through. 
Uh, so I read a, a report earlier on in the year, apparent PwC, they always come out with their executive pay or pay reports. And uh, still, the, the pay gap is, is very large. And according to the latest report, you know, women get paid 50% less than men for doing the same thing. And some say that that can also feed into gender-based violence, because if you've got less uh, uh, money in your pockets and less financial uh, security to stand and uh, independently, it makes the uh, appeal of staying where you are, as hard as it is, uh, a, a lot uh, seem better. But nonetheless, I'd just like to stay briefly in the boardroom uh, still. And Jeremy, just to bring you in here, just from the boardroom level, because uh, at the boardroom is, is, is where the direction of a company is decided, right? And so therefore, even if we just speak more broadly about gender equality, uh, is this something that can be and should be implemented at board level? No, absolutely. Um, within ABSA Kenya, we're, we're very passionate about this and we're very purposeful about um, our gender agenda in a way. Um, and that starts has got to start with the board because if it doesn't start with the board, it's not going to be implemented across the, the company. Um, and in 2013, what we did as a board is we, we were going through the process of uh, rotating and changing directors. And we made a very specific decision with the chairman to say, we want to try and get to as close to or to 50-50 uh, gender parity at the board. And we started that in 2013. And by 2014, we were the first company on the Nairobi Securities Exchange to achieve a 50-50 um, gender diversity mix at the board level. And, and I think it wasn't, it wasn't some kind of affirmative action. I mean, it was just being purposeful around finding the right caliber of board members and not accepting to just go the easy route. Um, and we, we found them and they've been great board members, um, you know, and we felt we've seen the benefits, um, you know, in terms of the way the company thinks about problems, um, the solutions we come up with by having much more balanced perspectives. Um, we've then obviously built in many more uh, programs we have, uh, you know, uh, a Kenya Women's Network Forum, which has several hundred women in it. And we, we've got targets that we, we want to develop, um, you know, future women leaders. We've partnered with Grasha Michelle, uh, New Faces, New Voices, and run programs with Na the Nairobi Securities Exchange to develop future women directors. Because the reality was, it was in the single digit percentages in terms of the number of directors on listed companies. Um, and that's just not acceptable. We, we feel that there's got to be a lot more progress um, you know, on this. So I think if companies are quite clear, you can, yes, you can start at the top, but you can also start at the bottom and say, we have 50-50 mix um, as a population, same in the company. But as you go higher up the company, you find then the numbers start dwindling. So we've set ourselves targets uh, to develop women into these roles, senior managerial roles, We've sponsored women into being even board directors in other companies um, and to train them. Um, and we, we just have to keep at it. Um, you know, it's one of, it's one of those uh, challenges that we feel makes absolute business sense. Um, yeah. And it has to be led from the top. Yeah. And I think uh, personally for myself, I look forward to, uh, you know, a lot more corporates normalizing the effect, you know, as was mentioned earlier by Techie and uh, a mark regarding the number of women, the higher up you go that fall away from the system because of the extra responsibilities that they assume of, of, of motherhood and the like. And I look forward to uh, walking into companies on a more normalized basis in which you've got a crash, right? You've got a crash there or a day center there at this company to ensure that, you know, a woman is able to uh, uh, wear both hats, a senior executive or manager, as all as as well as ensuring that she stays a, a responsible and an attentive mother. But uh, Richard, can I bring you back in, uh, sir, just to get your thoughts on the equality debate and just from a, a procurement perspective for entrepreneurs, given the fact that you work with so many uh, startups or have worked with so many startups, uh, we hear about proc procurement, including entrepreneurs in their supply chain. Uh, how successful uh, is this if it is happening? Yes, yeah, so, so it's interesting. Uh, for me, um, we, we've had a, a, a dearth of women in IT. And uh, I think that's a global challenge. It's, a, it's a, certainly a challenge we have in South Africa. 
and, and trying to get across uh, that space, because what we're finding is the work from home uh, agenda that's that's just crept in over this COVID time, uh, technologists are able to work from home. So it is the prime uh, 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 job allocation for a woman uh, uh, through, their, through their pregnancy era, et cetera, et cetera, looking after kids. They're able to be much closer to the family, yet they're able to work. So um, we certainly see an uptick in, in that capability, but it really is driving uh, the, the, the sourcing of women to come into IT the way, the way we see it. And I think also, uh, you know, gender-based violence uh, uh, creeps into this, you know, as you know, South Africa has a huge problem in this area. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we actually landed up focusing on that from an MIP perspective, because there's two sides to gender-based violence. There's also the performance side when someone is actually at work. You know, you don't know who's who's being uh, 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 being abused or whatever the case might be. So we actually used our technology um, uh, with, with an NGO in South Africa called Tears. Um, they provide crisis intervention, advocacy, counselling uh, for for domestic violence, sexual assault, and child sexual abuse. And we wrote a system for them because what we actually found was that most of the NGOs who were supporting abused people were actually reducing uh, their data to paper. And um, this organization, just in 20, 2019, took 88,000 calls from abused people to try and help them. And today they've actually got a system where we can start tracking and tracing the police officers, the counselors, the perpetrators, and the victims. To, to begin to give data, and this is actually where, where Tiki and I met, uh, where Tiki was starting to look at the data side of, of really looking at the problem and how that impacts our industry. Right. Uh, Nicole, as a woman in tech yourself, I uh, understand also one of the uh, most unequal when it comes to uh, gender parity. Uh, how do you think your industry should be influencing the uh, debate around equal access and equal access to pay and equal access to opportunity? Yeah, um, I mean, again, I go back to getting companies when they're really early, right? And pushing for a lot of our tech companies now, we have, you know, pay scales. I can't speak for other um, countries, but especially in Nigeria, for my company, for other companies we work for with there's like a flat and transparent scale by level so it's less contingent on your ability to negotiate or ask for things but how do you kind of you know work to kind of make that a bit more equal when we're looking at companies that we're investing in or how you're looking at management teams being structured um, you're asking for the women not to just, just to get equity but to get meaningful equity um, and even carta in the u.s you know a lot of companies all tech companies put their cap tables on Carta and they've been able to see the disparity, not just even from now cash compensation, from equity compensation as well, which has obviously much longer term, larger um, effect. And so how do you, you know, kind of encourage, enforce, push what that balance looks like? And I think, again, when a company is young, um, especially in our industry, it's an opportunity to be able to show the, like to be able to influence the behavior, right? And influence how they're making those decisions. Um, and so, yeah, tech has given opportunity for, for a lot of young women, whether it's through the actual companies that they're growing themselves, joining in non-technical roles that are still really critical um, in these tech companies, but it's up to the investors, the people in the ecosystem, those that are influencing the, the founders to be able to make this more equitable, not just from the cash side today, but also equity, which creates longer term wealth. Um, and I love the, the number of new funds like First Check Africa, that are giving you know early equity to women-led and gender diverse teams, and those again have meaningful equity. And you know, Axion and other funds that are making this a priority, um, and that's helping cause and push that shift. Thanks, Mark. Can you give us a, a global perspective, uh, just uh, maybe how some of the uh, companies in your part of the world on your radar are, are trying to address the issue of gender equality in the workplace? Well, you know, I mean, first, I wish I could say more was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, there are efforts being made. Um, I, you know, I thought what Jeremy described as starting with the board is exactly right. Uh, the change has to happen at the top if it's going to carry through the company. Um, but 
uh, you know, I, and, and again, I, I wish I could point to uh, rapid change on this issue. Uh, but I think, you know, we still see that the number of female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, in fact, decreased slightly last year. It's a minuscule percentage. Um, and, uh, you know, the efforts to uh, hire women, uh, I think efforts are being made, but on the other hand, candidly, uh, women suffered uh, more during the COVID-19 uh, unemployment. Uh, the jobs that were eliminated and that still have not come back, uh, many of them in service industries and restaurant industries were jobs that were disproportionately female. Uh, and so I think what we're seeing in the US, unfortunately, uh, is a situation that is probably worse on the whole uh, than it was a couple of years ago. Um, in part because of slow progress and in large part because COVID really did have a disproportionate effect on women and also disproportionate effect on people of color in the U.S. And so when you put those together, uh, the results have been uh, really disappointing, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully we can end on a more um, optimistic and upbeat note. Uh, we are coming towards the end of this uh, discussion. Uh, we have exactly eight minutes, so we have to <laughs> really be mindful of time now. So I'd like to ask each participant in terms of their uh, closing remarks and closing thoughts here, uh, one minute each, please. But if each of you can just share your hope and vision for Africa and one action point uh, towards achieving achieving that hope and that vision. And Racy, to begin with you. It seems we might not have Racy there, that is fine. Uh, Richard, uh, coming to you, your, uh, in a minute, your vision and hope for the continent and an action point. Okay, uh, so for me, the time for talking, public, ho public mm -hmm. holidays, marches and planning are over. Events like this one must be about updating our communities about what we are doing and what we have done. Everything I've spoken about is about what MIP are physically doing today in the areas where we believe we can make a difference from a board and an executive uh, perspective. Uh, my, my, my real passion right now is we've, we've tested uh, the, the, the system uh, to track and trace the gender-based violence victims at a central point. Uh, we want to, over the next two to three years, roll that out to all the NGOs and NPOs uh, in South Africa and even look north of the borders onto the continent. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, time for talking is over. Nicole? Yeah, so my my last kind of points and thoughts is just especially when those that have the ability to influence um, their partners, or early stage companies, the large corporates on here that are working with some of these technology companies and founders, you're in a position to be able to influence that, to be able to um, open up your process, to be able to get them to realize how important uh, thinking about equality, how important um, them being balanced and moving into, you know, being able to work with you and grow with you. Um, really is and you know being supportive of that innovation it's good that you are continuing to innovate yourself um, but give that opportunity to some of those younger tech founders and how they can kind of bring those solutions in um, and together create something that's a lot more meaningful and impactful overall right. wonderful uh shamil your thoughts here your your hope and your vision and just you know i suppose we can't talk about innovation without talking about uh, protecting that innovation right so i don't know if you'd be able to just rope in 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 that in the uh, closing remark that you're about to give just your thoughts on protecting some of the ip that comes out of the continent i think uh, so so firstly let me say um that, that for me the vision for the future is going to be further mm -hmm. together uh, so that it's through partnerships that we can get things done. Um, you know, we see ourselves as a sector of sectors, as an empowering sector. So um, extremely important that we can provide the requisite technologies, be it in fintech or in, um, in connectivity, to, to allow people to, to take advantage of, uh, of these platforms and to allow uh, lots of small businesses uh, and uh, um, customers access uh, to the latest technology. How we protect ourselves going forward, I think, um, firstly, 
as we establish ourselves, it's important to create the right uh, IP um, regulations within the continent. And actually, if we can establish a, a common framework where the IP rights basically applies throughout the continent uh, through the African Union, I think that would be uh, a, a fantastic achievement. But at the same time, as we scale globally, our products that come out of Africa, uh, we need to then ensure that we've taken the, the necessary uh, regulatory protections uh, globally as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Jeremy, uh, your final thoughts are from you. And again, if you can also just uh, rope in, in the uh, future vision and hope for the continent, uh, how integral the uh, free trade Africa area deal will be in uh, perhaps helping us leapfrog a lot of areas in which we are falling behind? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is uh, our vision to your first point is, is really around seeing a much more inclusive environment um, mm -hmm. where we can gain the benefit of, of all Africans across the continent, um, wh whether it's youth, whether it's women, and having very specific agendas as companies uh, as we do so. Um, when it comes to things like free trade, uh, again, I think there's hu huge opportunity for us to use innovation technology um, consistent policies that encourage that trade um, and can uplift the lives of others. Um, and there's many, there's many areas where we can see through partnerships um, and taking bold, courageous steps. So, for example, as ABSA, we've committed to empower one million women in the next five years to grow their businesses. Um, and we've, we've particularly helped them with um, gaining skills on international trade, partnering with the IFC where they get specific skills around taking their businesses international um, or bringing in international products to the country. So I think partnerships to what Jamil said is going to be essential. And then we all have to take personal responsibility to influence whether it's governments, each other, and hold each other to account to actually lead to impactful change um, in the short term, not think about these things as only long-term things that we uh, aspire to. All right. All right, perfect. Thanks, Jeremy. And uh, Mark, uh, can you just give us the uh, final word? Thank you very much, Fifi. Um, and just to say, you know, a, a pleasure to be here and inspiring to hear these leaders uh, talk about how these ideas uh, are not just academic ideas, are not just theory, uh, but actually work in practice. And uh, I, I just, it leaves me all the more confident uh, that the economic development and growth of Africa, its uh, continued and accelerated emergence on the world stage uh, is very much underway. And that we can see some real uh, growth, uh, some real changes, uh, some real new models uh, for business that leapfrog uh, some of the barriers that we see in the developed markets and give Africa a tremendous advantage. So thank you, Fifi. Thank you all. Thank you, Tiki, uh, for letting me be part of this uh, discussion today. Thank you uh, for joining us, Mark, and uh, certainly for uh, sharing your, your insightful uh, insights, as it were. And thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, in, my, in my job, I have the opportunity to engage with you uh, quite frequently, and that engagement is generally limited to you know, how much profits you've uh, reported in a certain period and how much uh, dividends you've paid to your shareholders. I'm really blown away at uh, the work that most of you are doing uh, with regard Regard to creating a shared value and doing a lot more uh, regarding inclusivity. And I think that uh, a lot more of those efforts needs to be brought in the uh, financial uh, reporting uh, for us to see. And uh, for those who are not doing enough to address the issue of inclusivity and shared value to also see particularly the financial benefits that can trickle out from uh, operating with a purpose, as it were. But thanks to you all. And uh, just uh, stay with us, Hank in a few moments longer uh, for our uh, closing remarks and our closing thoughts that will be delivered by Professor Chris uh, Ogebechi. Uh, he is the Dean and Professor of Strategic Management at Lagos Business School. 
and a visiting professor at Strathmore Business in Nairobi and the University of Kigali. Professor Ogbechi has over 30 years experience in corporate board matters and has been involved with several startups in Nigeria. He's also the founding director of the school's sustainability center. Uh, uh, Prof, I hand over the virtual uh, stage and mic to you, sir. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. And good morning to Mark. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be part of this 2021 CEO Connect. I'd like to start by thanking Tiki, the various speakers, and the entire Share Value Initiative for Africa for a very engaging time discussing the team, innovating for scale and equality. One Africa, one voice. Indeed, the presentations and discussions have been inspiring and insightful for all of us present. The keynote speaker kicked off, and an interesting takeaway from our talk is that opportunities for growth are driven by partnership and collaboration, and that access to finance and financial inclusion will be critical for success in Africa. And from our own experience in our place of work, it's obvious that sim simple digital and scalability are very key ingredients or formula for success as they have been, as they found them successful and learned. But Mark actually treated us to a good session. And it, for us, Mark warned that when companies start to focus on the social dimension as part of their core strategy, they become more profitable and successful. And that's something we have to take away. And that companies reducing their environmental footprint tend to also be more profitable. So many companies in Africa think that when you talk of shared value or sustainability, that you're actually increasing costs. But it's obvious from Mark's statement and experience and case studies to back that up that these matters, these issues actually increase profitability. Uh, purpose has to be at the core of the company as this actually motivates the employees. And when companies adopt social purpose, they can redefine their industry and also enable them to grow. But also pointed out that our culture is essential to put purpose into practice. But he regretted that the progress towards racial and gender inequality is very slow. And that we can actually disabuse our minds from some of the soft spots or blind spots that we find ourselves in, like this blind spot to hire people who look like us, that we can go beyond this. But for us to make, to make change happen, there must be a mandate, a policy. And actually reminded me of what happened a few years ago in Nigeria, when the central bank, the regulating body for banks in Nigeria, had a policy that at least 30% of all board members and senior management staff must be women. And that actually drove banks into increasing the participation of women on board and top leadership position. It's interesting to know that we now have many CEOs of banks that are women. And a lady actually heads one of the top three banks in Nigeria. But he advised us, realize that gender equality can be an economic game changer. But a long-term view is critical for success if we are going to pursue shared value. But the other issue that many companies are battling with is how do we measure the impact? And it has a simple formula for us that we should make it simple, focus on one or one, two or three important social environmental issues that will have the highest impact and track it. But we must bear in mind that shared value is about profit, profit with purpose. It's Special message for Africa is to let us know that population growth, natural resources, fertile ground, 
we make Africa one of the dominant economic forces in the world in the nearest future. That means the opportunities are enormous and that companies Africa will be able to leapfrog in various areas, including shared value. The various panelists reinforce Mark's views by sharing practical examples and outcomes in their various organizations. But there are some common trends trade in this, in this discussion by the panelists. And these, most, most of them, the trends are innovation, social dimension, scale, and technology. The discussions have made it clear that while we are all working very hard as CEOs and senior business executives to enhance innovation and promote equality among African businesses, there is still a huge gender and innovation gap that needs to be addressed to step up business contribution to the SDGs of the continent. In my closing remark, I would like to also point out a few, a few key points that, can take home, that we can take home from this dialogue. One, innovation is critical for remaining relevant and staying ahead of competitors and creating shared values for all stakeholders. And the best way for African businesses to predict their future is to create it. People and businesses that embrace innovation grow faster to achieve their goals, while others may toll through the staircase to reach their goals. They all agree with me that COVID-19 pandemic has changed most African businesses to embrace innovation, now to thrive. For instance, companies have how to adopt remote working as a way of reducing the exposure of staff to virus, to the virus. Remote working also allows for the inclusion of more women in the workforce. By embracing innovation, Africa has a unique opportunity to leapfrog in development by what we must do collaboratively in order to leave no one behind. In the energy sector in particular, Africa has the opportunity to leapfrog over investments in conventional energy sources and have a sustainable energy mix, including renewable, cleaner, cleaner and more sustainable solutions. While this will not reverse the damages and results of climate change, we can build up our infrastructure to be resilient to the risk brought about climate change. Mark has confirmed that companies with culturally diverse and gender inclusive employment profile generally outperform their competitors. So including more women in businesses not only helps to preserve their rights, but it is also good for business. We all agree that business has a responsibility in building the Africa we want, the Africa that meets the needs of the present but does not take away the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I would like to leave you with a quote by Richard Branson. There is no substitute for innovation. Original ideas will always rise to the top. Let me end by informing you that at the Lagos Business School, our purpose is to develop responsible leaders for Africa and the world. Shared value is part of our curriculum because we believe strongly in it, and we believe we can make a difference for the kind of leaders we produce for Africa and the world. I'd like to thank you again for the wonderful participants. I'd like to thank the panelists, our keynote speaker, and Mark for a wonderful afternoon or morning, wherever you are. And I hope we can all walk away with some interesting ideas that we can implement in organizations. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you. So thank you so much, Prof, for wrapping up quite a dynamic discussion. And I just have one more thing to add as we wrap up today's um, session. And just to remind everyone to please join us for the Africa Shared Value Leadership Summit taking place on the 8th and 9th of November. We will share more details on that. And really, I hope that we can all continue to have conversations around profit with purpose 
in action in our own organizations and within this um, you know, global uh, community that we're all part of. Thank you to all our attendees and our panelists and speakers, and I wish you all a good day further. Have a wonderful day. Chris Beany on the track.